good day friends all of us know that certain events have split the world history into two for example the arrival of lord jesus christ has split world timetable into bc and ad there have been many events like that which have split the world history into two and one of them was the protestant reformation which took place about 500 years ago the protestant reformation took place over one doctrine one key doctrine that gives rise to a number of related doctrines and that doctrine is justification by faith today i would like to introduce justification by faith to you and also i would like to discuss why this doctrine is so important for evangelical christians or conservative christians and why this doctrine became the key reason for splitting up the history of church into two the pre reformation era and the post reformation era the bible verse or verses that are the key to our study today are found in romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 Romans chapter 5 verses 1 and 2 where we read therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god through our lord jesus christ by whom by whom also we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of god as to why this verse is became so important or why this was the turning point in reformation and as to why it is so important to each one of us today to understand this doctrine we have to look at the word justification and exactly what this word means we all use the word justification in our day to day lives um particularly when we say that uh, i am trying to justify myself or he is trying to justify or that there is no justification for such a thing all of them come from the same word and the same meaning justification means to declare that a person is innocent not that he has been pardoned please notice a person who has been pardoned has been pardoned because he has done something wrong pardon is not justification justification means declaring that a person is innocent that is the meaning in which uh, the scripture also uses this term when god declares that a person is not guilty he also declares that that person is innocent he also declares that that person is righteous a number of things are involved in justification now all of you know that man right from his birth deep in his heart he knows that he is not innocent that's the reason why we have a large number of religions with each religion trying to tell its followers exactly how to obtain forgiveness of god only forgiveness of god let me remind you only forgiveness because a sinner all what a sinner can hope from god is a declaration that this sinner has been forgiven not that he is righteous not that he is just because he is not righteous he is not just he is not innocent and that's the reason why he needs pardon okay but the bible goes beyond pardon and introduces the idea of justification where god declares that a uh, certain human is just or justified or righteous and he is innocent we all know that this is not possible humanly it is not possible because none of us is innocent none of us is just none of us is righteous we all have sinned and though the scripture says that all have sinned actually every person or almost every person who can think normally and who thinks normally knows that he is a sinner and as i said that's why there is such a multiplicity of religions everybody knows that 
he is a sinner every person knows he is a sinner and he needs forgiveness from god okay so the greatest barrier against justification is our own sin a person who has sinned he can seek forgiveness he can obtain forgiveness but he cannot get himself declared as uh, a non offender as innocent as righteous or as just the scripture very clearly mentions this in isaiah chapter 64 verse 6 where we read but we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousness are filthy rags and we all do fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away so though humans know in their heart that they are sinners we as christians we examine everything in the light of the scripture and the scripture very clearly says that our righteousness is like filthy rags that means whatever we do the best that we do is like filthy rags and it is full of iniquity and that's a reason why no human can be justified and no human can even get pardoned because if you have done sin you have to undergo punishment when we come to romans chapter 3 verse 10 that once again reminds that no human is righteous we also see that the unrighteous cannot inherit god's kingdom we find that in first corinthians 6 9 now the biggest question is how can a sinner be justified i think that's going too far a far more basic question would be how can a human obtain god's forgiveness because without forgiveness you cannot expect anything else see if a person is not forgiven he is sinner he is guilty and there is no way in which he can be declared innocent so the first step is forgiveness and even after forgiveness he remains only a forgiven sinner he cannot be declared as innocent whereas the scripture says that god has made provision for people to be justified so how how does that happen the first step is forgiveness and after forgiveness something else happens we see in romans chapter 4 verse 6 even as david also described described the blessedness of the man unto whom god imputeth righteousness without works we need to go into a little bit of uh, the details here the scripture very clearly says that god is imputing righteousness so yes uh, you and i who are born sinners we can definitely come to a stage in our christian life whether it is continuous or not that's a different thing we will discuss that later but we can come to a stage where god declares us righteous how does that, how does god do that as we read in romans chapter 4 verse 6 uh, david describes the blessedness of the man unto whom god imputes righteousness what is imputation imputation means something is taken and given to you it is imputed to you something like someone taking a huge amount of money and transferring into your account so that money has been imputed to your account somewhat similar to that god definitely imputes righteousness to you and once god imputes righteousness you become righteous because if the creator imputes nobody can uh, disimpute or nobody can say that you ha- you are not righteous but before god can impute righteousness to you and me something else has to take place and that is forgiveness of sins so the concept or the process takes place somewhat this way when a person accepts lord jesus as his savior god forgives him based upon the work of christ god forgives that person so that person becomes a forgiven sinner and then god imputes righteousness unto that person the forgiven sinner and once god imputes righteousness to that person that person is righteous and once the person is righteous 
and once God declares that person to be righteous, that person is righteous, that person is justified, that person is innocent. Everything from his past life has been taken away. He becomes a new creature. That is why in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 we read, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, which means he becomes totally new. That's the basics of justification by faith. But the question is, if things are so simple, if God simply forgives a person when he accepts Lord Jesus as his personal savior, and if God imputes righteousness unto him, couple of questions come to our mind. One is, how does it happen? Well, that we will discuss later. The second is, why don't we declare it to everybody? Because if God is, the eternal God is so gracious that he is willing to forgive sinners and impute his righteousness to sinners, that's a wonderful news. Why not let us declare it to everyone? Yes, that's a very legitimate question and that's a question on which we need to focus for a few minutes to understand how important it was for Martin Luther and his followers and his contemporaries to rediscover this doctrine. Yes, I said rediscover, not discover. There is a background to it. If a person knows that he's, he is a forgiven sinner, that means he is no longer reckoned by God as a sinner. And if a person knows that God has imputed his righteousness unto him, he becomes free, he becomes spiritually free. He lives a life of joy. He is no longer a slave of any human being. And that's something which, which religious establishments hate. You need to realize that for thousands of years that man has been in this world, whether it is politics or it is or religion or any other kind of movement, while many of them start in a benevolent manner, most of them very soon degenerate into the control of a few. A few people control religion, a few people control business, a few people control politics, ultimately not to benefit people to, but to benefit themselves. Let me repeat, there is politics, there is rule of government, there are rules of kings, there are rules of emperors all around the world. Many of the governments are definitely taking care of their people. Many of the kings do take care of their people. But please remember that these governments and these kings or rulers are only an exception. Right from the beginning of mankind, those who rule, whether they rule at the religious level or at the political level, they rule basically for their own benefits. What kind of benefits you may say? Well, power gives a lot of benefit, particularly financial security and financial freedom. That's the reason why people struggle with each other to be become the next elected representative or the next king or the next ruler of a monarchy. And that's the reason why among uh, the children of a, of a ruler, there is always a fight as to who shall inherit the kingdom. Not because they want to serve the people. A few do serve. I do not ignore that. I do not deny that. But the majority do not serve people. They serve their own interests. And wherever there is power, eventually people come into power or people take hold of power who would use that power to serve themselves. The same thing happened in the church and that's how the doctrine of justification by faith was forgiven. Now, we all know that worldwide religious leaders, they oppress and they exploit people. They become billionaires. They live in castles. They live in palaces. Their family lives in luxury. To maintain all this, it's essential for those religious leaders to keep their people in slavery. 
if people have equal rights then naturally nobody can make money from the people or nobody can exploit them the christian faith started around AD 33 as a movement of the holy spirit people came to lord jesus they saw each others as brothers and sisters so much so that in acts we read about a time when rich people and even those who were not rich they were sacrificially selling their property and laying it at the feet of the apostles so that the apostles can use that money to take care of their brothers and sisters the christian faith is a faith where the brotherhood of believers not only priesthood but brotherhood is emphasized priesthood is also a very important part and that's a very important part of uh, justif- the process of justification but gradually as christian started growing many people found that if they can control a church or a number of churches then eventually they would have great power they would have religious power they would have political power and they would also have much financial power and almost uh, around 100 AD such struggle started but the struggle reached a climax when the roman emperor constantine became a christian i said became a christian i did not say when he accepted christ because doesn't seem that he accepted christ because of some miracle in his life he became a christian and immediately he declared christianity to be the official religion of the roman empire and once christianity was declared as the as the religion of the roman empire all the roman priests who were worshiping roman gods all these pagans they suddenly became christian priests these people very clearly understood struggle for power and also that if you have power that translates to much freedom in life arbitrariness in life ability to dictate others and also money a lot of people within the church who were in prominent positions at that time when constantine declared christianity to to be the official religion they also understood the value of power and therefore in 3rd ad 3rd century ad the struggle for power started in the roman empire and since roman empire controlled almost all the known world and since there were christians in almost all these places those who were appointed as bishops and archbishops by the roman empire they became extremely powerful people and there started the exploitation of christianity for the first time it's instead of preaching freedom christianity became a religion that made slaves that made slaves of millions upon millions of people through the christian religion i did not say christian faith through the christian religion now christian faith is a faith that gives much freedom it tells you that you are saved it tells you that you are a royal priesthood and that as a royal priesthood you do not need anybody else to represent you to god you can represent yourself to god this kind of message of freedom it would be very very harmful to these priests to hold on to their power and therefore the first thing they did was they gradually tried to hide the message of the bible and eventually the bible was abolished from the christian church by the time of martin luther bibles were no longer read by common people in fact common people were forbidden from reading the bible and after the protestant reformation broke out the church at that time confiscated bibles punished people even killed them and seized their property for one single guilt and what was that guilt that they had a bible in their homes so in the 3rd century ad christianity moved from a declaration of faith or christianity moved from a faith and it became a religion it became an organized religion and from 3rd century up to 1500s 
the actual message of the bible was completely suppressed it was completely hidden of course there were many many smaller groups which hiding in uh, hiding in remote villages even in forests they used to declare the gospel they used to declare the gospel of salvation by faith they used to declare all these things but the church which was controlled by priests bishops and the pope they had completely banished and abolished and completely hidden the message of the bible and the message is believe in lord jesus christ you will be saved not because of your works but because of your faith and the moment you would be saved you would also be declared just and righteous innocent by god so in summary this message of justification by faith was completely suppressed by the organized church because the church had become a slave maker for them religion was a tool through which they were controlling and by controlling they were exploiting people martin luther was a roman catholic monk who felt great restlessness in his heart he became restless because he was born in a generation where many others were reading the bible bibles were not available easily but there were some to whom bible was available not in common man's language but in latin and greek and hebrew but these were people who knew these languages they started reading they started exhorting each other and therefore martin luther came under the influence of a number of people who encouraged him to read and study the bible and as he started studying the bible he felt a great restlessness in his heart and therefore he kept on studying kept on studying and one day finally he read romans chapter 5 verse 1 which i had read a few minutes ago which says therefore being justified by faith and suddenly the key was there suddenly he found the key to understand exactly how a person can have a relationship with god he realized that once a person believes in lord jesus and accepts him as his personal savior god justifies that person on the basis of faith that was the turning point how does god do it here are the steps in human language god does it in an instant but for our understanding let me break it up into a number of points first corinthians 6:15 tells us first corinthians 6:15 do you not know that your bodies are the members of christ friends what happens is somewhat like this in human chronological order when a person understands that he is a sinner when he understands that as a sinner he is destined to everlasting death and as he understands that christ came to this world to die on his behalf and that if he accepts christ his sins will be forgiven and as he accepts christ as his savior his sins are forgiven not only are his sins forgiven at that moment god the holy spirit takes him and makes him members of the body of christ that's why the scripture repeatedly uses this expression members of the body holy spirit takes this person and unites him to a body which is symbolically the body of christ which is also the real body of christ uh that statement is found in first corinthians chapter 14 where it says that it is the same spirit who takes and baptizes each one of us into the body of christ so a person recognizes that he is a sinner he recognizes that christ died for him he accepts christ as his personal savior he is forgiven and since he is forgiven god the holy spirit takes him and unites him with the body of christ and once he is united with the body of christ all the communicable attributes of christ are communicated to him 
and one of them is righteousness. There are some non-communicable attributes such as uh, omniscience, omnipresence that remain with God but many things from God are now communicated to mankind and one of them is righteousness. In Romans chapter 4 verse 22 to 25 we read and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Repeatedly we see a word imputation. Just as a person takes, if a person takes millions of, millions from, of currency from his account and transfers it to your account and just as it becomes yours from that moment onwards, the moment that Holy Spirit unites you and me with the body of Christ, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to you. It is imputed to me. 24th verse says, But for us also to whom it shall be imputed. 25th verse, Who, that means Christ was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. So, the doctrine of justification can be summarized in this manner. We all know we are sinners. Sinners can be pardoned, but they cannot be justified. Only a just person can be justified. Other religions, they promise pardon. Christian faith promises not only pardon, but also justification. Other faiths, they cannot offer justification because they do not know about the work of Christ. Christian faith offers justification because Christ came to this world not only to give us salvation, not only to give us everlasting life, but also to unite us with him so that we share his imputed justification. That is the doctrine of justification by faith. The moment you and I accept Christ as our Savior, God imputes the, the righteousness of Christ to you and me and declares that this person is innocent. He is not guilty. How does he do that? First of all, our sins are forgiven. Second, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us. So God, when God looks at us, he looks at us as righteous people. This is righteousness by imputation. Now there are few things that you should understand. When the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, it doesn't mean that we are transformed instantaneously into absolutely righteous people. Actually, this is a position that is granted to us. But once this position is granted to us, God expects that we would walk according to this position. I am sure you, that you are interested in history and you keep reading news about when people in high positions make mistakes. A slip of a tongue, improper clothing, improper attitude, improper emotions and we immediately know that they forgot their position. It's the same way with God's children. Once God grants us a position as God's children, and once he makes us just and righteous positionally, he expects that we would never forget that and that we would behave in our thoughts, in our speech, and in our action in keeping with what has been granted to you and me. So, everyone who is in Christ Jesus is a new creation. Behold, all things have become new. Old things have passed away. So, you and I, we have been forgiven. We have been given everlasting life. We have been united with the body of Christ. And the imputation of Christ has been in I am sorry, and the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to us. And now when the Creator God looks at you and me, He does not look at us as forgiven sinners. 
rather he looks at us as righteous people as innocent people but he also expects us to behave in keeping with that position which he has granted to us and there lies the problem our sin nature is not removed from us that shall be removed only when we leave these mortal bodies and receive from god our glorified bodies that's why in romans chapter 7 the scripture says that things that i hate i find myself doing things that i want to do i simply am unable to do so that sin nature is there in our body continually struggling with us our body soul and spirit and trying to make us sin that's all the more reason why we as god's children should be very careful to trust upon the holy spirit to lead us in manner or lead us in ways where we live in conformity with our justification when we go to the epistle of james there james very clearly says that our works should prove to the world that we are justified if you are a king's child you cannot behave like a criminal what about you and me we are god's children we are co heirs with christ and therefore we cannot behave like criminals biblically speaking we should not sin in our lives because sin is a crime that's the implication of justification so uh, though there are a number of other implications today i would like to leave you with two implications number 1 when you approach god you can approach with confidence that's why romans chapter 5 1 says that we have peace with god the word peace uh, when it, when the king james bible was translated it meant fellowship or access a criminal cannot have access to righteous god but since we were justified by faith because of that justification god sees us as just and righteous and that's why we have access unto god and since we are people who are just and righteous who have been given access to god we have to use that privilege each day moment by moment to be in fellowship with god that takes place through reading of the scripture through reflection through meditation and particularly through prayer so of the two things that i want to uh, leave with you today as implications of implications of justification by faith the first is my dear brother my dear sister we have access unto god do you use that if not that is either because of carelessness or because like adam and eve you are trying to hide yourself from god because instead of listening to the holy spirit you listen to the old sin nature the second thing or the second exhortation that i want to leave with you is this listen even the people of this world know that you and i are special even if we don't declare it to them they do understand it because since we are god's children there are elements in our thought life in our speech life and in our actions which they perceive as something unique which they don't have and that's why they understand that we are special people and since they understand that we are special people they also expect us to behave like special people a king's son a prince is expected to behave like a prince not as a commoner never as a criminal in the same way people of this world they recognize that we are god's children you and i are god's children and they expect us to behave in a manner that is different from their behavior they don't expect us to behave like them and they do not expect us to behave like a sinner since that expectation is there and since we are god's children 
it is our responsibility every day in our lives to be faithful to our call that call depends upon our position position has been granted to us a call has been issued and therefore we need to be very careful in our thought life very careful in our speech life very careful in our conduct we cannot do what the ordinary people do we cannot speak the way they speak we cannot think the way they think that is why romans chapter 12 says that our mind should be transformed that is why sam 1 says that we should not be in the company of the wicked because as god's children as justified people god does not expect us there even the world does not expect us there that is my exhortation but in closing let me remind you once again the doctrine of justification by faith is a doctrine of liberation and that's the reason why the organized church kept it hidden from people they did not want people to be free if people know that they are free they shall not become slaves of the organized church but 500 years ago martin luther rediscovered this truth he declared it and the protestant movement started it split the church into two one who believe in the justification one who know about justification and one who do not know about justification starting from there the christian church has come much farther we have discovered a lot of truths that were hidden but they all depend upon the doctrine of justification by faith that's reason why this doctrine is so important my dear brother and sister you have accepted christ you are no longer a sinner you are part of the body of christ and therefore you are justified god when he looks at you he looks at you not as a forgiven sinner he looks at you as his own son his own son and daughter who is just who is righteous and my question is have we recognized that have you recognized that have you understood that since god looks at me and you in that manner therefore we have complete access to him do we use that access do you use that access if not what is the excuse second the world knows who we are they have great expectation from us god also has great expectation from us as his justified children are you and i am i are you faithful to that call does the world see christ in us if not what is his excuse yes my question is what is the excuse not what is the reason it cannot be a reason it has to be an excuse because god has given us everything needed to live a life where every day we conform unto the image of his son we are united to his body his righteousness has been imputed to us now each day we have to be conformed unto his image may the good lord help each of, each one of us to understand the seriousness and the implications and the enormity of this call so that each day we live closer and closer to our god with whom we have access and also so that each day we grow closer and closer unto christ so that eventually we might be confirmed unto his image god bless you